Hello and welcome again to my physics online video lecture supplement series. Today's video I'm going to be continuing my lecture set that's discussing uniform circular motion, orbits, uh, circular motion in general, and gravitation. And specifically today I'm going to continue the lecture set with part four on this uh, which is going to be focused on gravitation. And I'm specifically going to focus on Newton's law of universal gravitation, uh, which is basically a synthesis of his laws of motion along with Kepler's laws for planetary orbits. Um, so this is drawing on information from the previous part of this lecture set, but also from maybe the last lecture set that uh, I posted if you go in the sequential order of these lecture sets. And I'm going to look at Newton's law of universal gravitation itself, but I'm also going to look at a couple applications of it, namely uh, tidal forces, which you can see uh, at play here actually, which is a black hole that's uh, basically ripping apart some star that's a little bit uh, too close to it. So there's enough uh, tidal force here to actually pull matter off the surface of the star and into the black hole. I'm not really going to talk in today's video about Einstein's general relativity theory, but I thought that I would mention it, especially since, well, I have this picture of a black hole and um, those largely are predicted thanks to Einstein's general relativity theory. So we're going to look at basically Newton's law of universal gravitation and maybe we'll look a little bit at tidal forces and a few other special applications in today's video. So cutting to the chase with Newton's law of universal gravitation, uh, the law basically states that every particle that has that is in the universe that has some mass is attracted to every other particle in the universe that has some amount of mass. And it turns out that this attraction is uh, predictable uh, based on essentially the mass of the two particles, uh, which is actually the equivalent of the inertial mass of each particle. Uh, divided by the square of the distance between the two particles. And this then is multiplied by a force constant which is sometimes called the universal gravitation constant. Therefore the equation which relates these um, the, the force to the two masses and the distance is given by Fg which is the force of gravity equals some constant times the mass of the first object times the mass of the second object divided by the distance between the two squared. And so this gives you the magnitude of the force between the two. The direction of the force is generally attractive and so if you wanted to express this force in its proper vector form you might write something like this. Fg, the uh, force vector, is negative g, again that gravitational constant, times the mass of the first, times the mass of the second, times the vector displacement between the two, divided by the distance between the two cubed. Now notice that this is actually the same equation as before, just that it includes a direction in it. You may be wondering why is there an r cubed down on the bottom, whereas there was an r squared before. That's just a convention because you want to include here the vector that's the displacement from one to the other. So this is basically calculating in this diagram the uh, Fg force on this mass number one and the vector of displacement between mass one and mass two would start at the center of mass one and end at the center of mass two. It has a length of r. So this vector right here has a length of r and a direction that points from the center of one to the center of the one that's uh, acting on it. And so because we're multiplying by this extra distance r in this vector, then we have to divide out by r to make the magnitude work out. This is equivalent, by the way, to saying that fg is negative 
G M1 M2 R hat over R squared. So if you replace this vector R with the unit vector R hat, then you have an R squared in the denominator. And so you see that these are consistent. Um, you already understand at this point what the masses of the two objects are and what the displacement is or how to find that. If not, you might want to go back and review uh, lecture set number five and also lecture set number two. The thing that I haven't told you yet is what the value of this universal gravitational constant g is. So it's listed down here. It has an approximate value 6.67 times 10 to the minus 11 newton meters squared per kilogram squared. So you see that if you multiply this number g times the mass times the mass um, what you're going to do is eliminate these two kilograms uh, squareds on the bottom and then you're dividing by a uh, distance cubed but also multiplying by a distance to the first power that gets rid of this meters squared and so you're left with newtons for the force as you should expect. All right, so there's a few other notes to be said about gravity. Um, one is that we're not really going to do Gauss's law this semester, but there's a thing called Gauss's law that usually is applied to um, electric fields and actually also to magnetic fields. But in principle, it could be applied equally to any other field that, um, that you want. Uh, and gravity is a field force, so you could apply this to the gravity field. And what Gauss's law basically does is it tells us that if you have an extended object that has a spherical shape and a symmetrical density distribution, then for any observer standing outside of the object, the force that that object applies on the observer will act exactly the same as the force that's applied by a point mass that has the same mass as the object but that is located at the center of the object. So what this is basically meaning is when you're standing on the surface of the earth and you want to figure out how much gravity the earth is pulling on you with, we've, we've so far done that by multiplying your mass times the gravity field um, strength, which is little g, 9.8 newtons per kilogram. Um, you could also use Newton's law of universal gravitation, but if you wanted to do that, you'd have to figure out what every individual piece of mass for the entire planet is, where it's located with respect to you, therefore what's the uh, force from gravity from that, and then you'd have to do a vector sum of all that. So that's basically making use of a thing called the superposition principle. Well, thanks to Gauss's law, it turns out that you can do this much more easily by treating the force of gravity from the Earth as if you had the entire mass of the Earth packed at the very center of the Earth. You're standing on the surface, so you need to know what the radius of the Earth is and you need to know what the mass of the Earth is. And then you get the correct value um, of your weight, basically, or of, or of what the gravitational force between the Earth and you is. And so this makes a lot of calculations easier because all of a sudden planets, stars, whatever, can be treated more or less like point masses uh, for the purpose of our force calculations. For that matter, if you were to dig down into the Earth a little bit, so you go below the surface of the Earth, you basically can break the Earth up into, you might call it, two concentric spheres or sphere shells. So there's the solid sphere that is still below you that includes the, the uh, core of the Earth and so on. And so the amount of mass that is that is contained within that shell uh, on whose surface you're standing is the amount of mass that you'd have effectively acting on you gravitationally pulling you to the center of the Earth. And you can treat that mass as being at the Earth's center. And then any mass on the shell that is above where you're standing 
effectively ends up having zero net force upon you. It turns out if you figure out how much mass there is and where it's located and how much force each of that is, you add it all together as a vector sum, you'll end up getting zero. So let's work a couple quick examples with this. Um, the first example, uh, really both of these examples are uh, in part because, well, if you've been paying attention, you know that NASA recently announced that they had found uh, in the TRAPPIST-1 system seven planets that, that they discovered orbiting the star TRAPPIST-1. And these seven planets basically are all near Earth size. In fact, you can list, you can see down here um, radii and masses relative to the Earth. So this number right here for TRAPPIST 1b, 1.09 times the radius of the Earth, 0.85 times the mass of the Earth. And as you can see, all of these things are within a factor of. Uh, maybe plus or minus 25% on the radius. In fact, even a smaller uh, uh, margin on the plus sides. And you can see that the mass is similarly within plus or minus maybe 30%. So what I wanted to do here was look at what the uh, gravity strength between the star TRAPPIST 1a and the planet TRAPPIST 1f would be. Um, so in theory 1f and 1g are actually basically in the habitable zone where there would be liquid water on the surface. 1e maybe has that. The others are a bit too close and so they're going to tend to be very hot planets uh, and 1h is maybe too far away so it'll be icy. So let's look at for TRAPPIST 1f. So in order to get started on this um, problem, uh, we're going to need to look up some information because we were given a distance in astronomical units and we're given masses with respect to the mass of the sun and the mass of the earth. So I'm pulling up the University Physics uh, Volume 1 textbook, which you can get from OpenStax. Um, the College Physics textbook will also have this information in it if you happen to be uh, using that book instead. Basically you want to go to the appendix that gives you astronomical data and so here we have appendix D astronomical data so we scroll down and we see that it gives us stuff like the mean distance from the Sun so the Earth, the mean distance from the Sun, is 149.6 million kilometers. So the reason why we need that piece of information is because it tells us what is the value of an astronomical unit. So an astronomical unit is approximately 149.6 million kilometers. The other two pieces of information we are going to want are these two listed down here, which are the mass of the Earth and the mass of the Sun. So the mass of the Earth is right here. The mass of the Sun is right here. We need those two pieces of information because that's what was given to us by um, the problem that we're trying to work. So I've written in here, therefore, what all of our given information is and then what equation we're going to want to use to solve this problem. So the distance that we're using R or R1A to R1F, if you'd rather, is 0 0.037 astronomical units. So we need to multiply whoops, that by 100 uh, or 1.496 times 10 to the 11 meters per one astronomical unit. Okay, and so what that's going to give us is the uh, distance in meter. So we end up with about um, 5.54 billion meters. And then the other thing that we need is to convert these two masses, um, which I've done here. So the mass of the Sun, 1.99 uh, divided by 12 uh, times, of course, 10 to the 30 kilograms is going to give us an approximate mass of actually about 1.66 um, times 10 
to the 29 kilograms. So there's an approximate mass for the star. And then likewise, we need to find an approximate mass for the planet. So that's the 0.68 times 5.97 times 10 to the 24. Um, so this right here gives us like 4.06 times 10 to the 24 um, kilograms. So if we want to figure out what the total force is, we plug in all these numbers that we found above, uh, plus that universal gravitational constant, which was 6.67 times 10 to the minus 11 newton meters squared per kilogram squared. So it's going to be that times the 1.66 times 10 to the 29 kilograms times 4.06 times 10 to the 24 kilograms and then that is to be divided by the um, distance squared between the two uh, planets, which is this guy up here. So 5.54 times 10 to the 9 meters squared. Sorry, I said distance between the two planets. I mean the distance between the planet and the star. So throw this into your calculator and what you end up getting is something like 1.46 times 10 to the 24 newtons. So this is the force of gravity between the star and the planet. And as a secondary example, we might ask, what's the force between the planet and the star? Or in other words, how much force does the planet pull on the star with? And it's going to be the same number. That is, in fact, a Newton's third law pair. All right, so what I have left in the lecture at this point is sort of some interesting points, tidbits, and applications of all this. So one interesting um, effect is what is the actual apparent weight of a person or object on the earth and the reason why I asked this question is the earth is actually rotating about some axis and this rotation about the axis is going to have some real effect on the weight of a person who's standing somewhere on the earth um, to wit you have to have some centripetal force which actually needs to point towards the axis that you're rotating about perpendicularly to that axis because let's say you're standing here um, in sort of southern Alabama or maybe you're standing here in whatever Saudi Arabia anyhow as the earth is spinning you by standing still are actually going about a circle with a radius r as described by this picture. And that implies that you have to have some centripetal force that points towards the center of that circle. Now the force of gravity points towards the center of the earth which as you can see is not the same thing as the center of the circle. So the end result of this is that the apparent weight that you'd read from a scale um, for example, here's a scale, might be decreased somewhat depending upon where you're standing and how fast the Earth is spinning. Um, basically, the uh, size of the circle that you describe in your orbit is going to depend upon, of all things, the cosine of some angle lambda that tells you how far are you altitude wise with respect to the um, equator. Uh, um, basically the cosine of this angle times the radius of the earth will give you the radius of the circle that you're sort of describing as the earth uh, spins about its axis. And if you're standing on the ground or if you are um, sort of hanging from a scale, whatever it is, your net force has to ultimately give you the centripetal force. And you can calculate what that centripetal force is because you need to know uh, basically what is the Earth's rate of spinning. So this is omega for the Earth. And you need to know something about maybe the radius of the Earth. Um, 
and as you know from previous lecture set, the centripetal acceleration should be your tangential speed squared divided by radius, which is the same thing as the um, frequency squared times the radius um, for, for a given uh, value of omega. So that gets you what the centripetal acceleration is, and then that times your mass tells you what the centripetal force is. Well, that centripetal force must be the sum of the other forces that are acting on you. Specifically, there's gravity. If you're hanging from a scale, there's basically gravity and the force that the scale pulls on you with. If you're standing on the surface of the Earth, there's gravity, there's a normal force, and there's friction. And so... Um, because gravity itself is not really affected and because the direction of the normal force is not really affected, then the magnitude and direction of the scale reading, which is your weight, and for that matter the magnitude, though not necessarily the direction of the normal force, and likewise the magnitude and direction of the friction force, are what are affected by the differences in spin rate of the Earth. And um, so this is this means that you will get a slight effect. It turns out that it's not a very large adjustment, maybe about 0.3% uh, or 0.4% of the value of gravity that is different between, say, your scale reading and your actual weight, thanks to the spin of the Earth. Okay, second uh, point, which kind of builds off of this one, what is the value of g? Now, um, bear in mind that g is technically the gravitational field strength, so the unit for that is newtons per kilogram, although it is also um, used often to describe the free fall acceleration, which is basically the acceleration that an object undergoes due to gravity only, and that is in meters per second squared. So those two things are, they're not the same quantity per se, but they're kind of equivalent quantities. If you know one, you know the other. It's just a change in units. And um, two, in fact, equivalent units, uh, dimensionally equivalent units. But it turns out that the value of little g is variable even on the surface of the Earth. So here I'm showing a table that I pulled from the Giancali textbook and it tells you some different locations around really the world if you count the fact that we have the equator and we have Australia and so on and the North Pole but there's a uh, different elevations as well so the elevation tells you are you on a mountain are you in a valley these are basically mountains and these ones are all basically at sea level um, but the other difference, of course, is that this location changes the value of lambda here. And there's therefore basically two effects for that. One is the effect from the actual spinning of the Earth, um, which is a relatively minor effect. But the other is that the actual radius of the Earth is not perfectly uniform. The Earth is not a perfect sphere, and that's true even if you ignore mountains and valleys. So you can see that even though the elevation is sea level for New York and San Francisco and Sydney and the equator and the North Pole, the actual value of the free fall acceleration and of the gravitational field at those locations is different. And a large part of that difference is just because at the North Pole, the radius or distance to the center of the Earth is actually slightly less than it is at the equator. And similarly, the pattern follows because San Francisco is closer to the equator and farther from the pole than New York. And so you see that the closer you get to the pole, the higher the value of G. And similarly, the closer you get to the equator, the lower value uh, of g. Similarly, if you increase your elevation, even at a um, given value of lambda, in other words, at a given value 
of latitude or of um, latitude and longitude for that matter although in that case you're either on a mountain or you're not um, if you climb up to the top of a mountain what happens is your elevation gets larger it means that r is also getting larger it means that you'd expect the value of g to get smaller and an interesting thing that i wanted to mention um, we have quite a few students um, or have had for the last few years quite a few students here from nepal and in teaching one of the labs that i did on campus we measured the value of G and the students asked uh, what is the value of G here because it turns out that in the particular region of Nepal that some of these guys were from they cited a different value of G than the 9.80 value that we use as our standard in Troy Alabama so we usually take g to be 9.80 meters per second squared but your results may vary a little bit depending upon where you're from okay another interesting thing um, to talk about is how the value of big g was measured that is the gravitational constant not the gravitational acceleration little g but the gravitational constant big g and it turns out that there have been a variety of interesting experiments conducted to attempt this. And maybe the earliest one that I know of is the Cavendish experiment. And I don't think he actually was necessarily trying to measure the value of big G, but it turns out that that is something he could get from his experiment. So his experiment basically looks like this. Um, there's a uh, little arm with a pair of very thin, very lightweight rods that is suspended from a rope or a string or a second rod that is free to rotate. And at the end of it, there are two masses which are uh, large-ish. They're large compared to the mass of the rods, for example and then fixed to the ground there's an additional pair of larger masses and initially this is set up so that the uh, smaller masses are misaligned from the larger masses in other words they're along this dotted or this dashed line that kind of points in and out of the screen if you will and so there's a gravitational attraction between the big mass and the little mass here and between this big mass and this little mass here which causes the whole thing to spin now in his original experiment I don't think he used a light source and a mirror the light source in the mirror is actually useful to sort of amplify this effect what happens is you send a, a light maybe a laser beam for example and all else being equal the laser beam should hit the mirror at some particular angle and it will reflect at the same angle that it was incident on so as this mirror rotates what's going to happen is the angle of incidence and therefore the angle of reflection is going to change and so you can basically watch the little uh, bright spot that's projected onto the wall uh, from your laser reflecting off the mirror and it will move pretty drastically even for a small change in the position of these two smaller masses and thus the angle of the mirror so if you vary the value of either these large masses or these small masses it doesn't really matter which one you do what you will find is um, a difference in the amount of force now it's probably best to, marry, to uh, vary the large masses because if you vary the small masses your force is going to vary but your acceleration is going to be constant and so this part of the experiment is pointless but you could in principle measure the force if you do it this way I'd vary the smaller masses that's going to give you a difference in acceleration of the smaller masses hence a difference in acceleration of the spot on the wall and by doing that if you know what the value of this mass and this mass is you can start sort of plotting data to figure out what the acceleration is or for that matter what the force is and from that 
everything is known save for the value of that constant g, you can get the value of the constant g. Turns out that there's other um, ways of measuring the value of the gravitational constant, by the way. One is that you could try to figure out what the mass and the radius of a very large object like the planet is. So the Greeks actually had a way of measuring the radius of the Earth using geometry. I don't want to go too much into that, but it basically has to do with how large of a shadow gets projected by a pole of some known length at two different locations of uh, latitude around, um, you know, towards the equator and towards the, the uh, pole. So they could get the rough radius of the Earth then you can try to figure out what the mass is based on the density, but then you have to know what the material of the Earth is made up of. So the problem there is that if you sample the Earth's surface, you get mostly oxygen, maybe some nitrogen and silicon, carbon, that kind of thing. But if you go deeper, you end up with iron or nickel and iron, that kind of thing, metals. So the density is a little hard to obtain if you don't already sort of know the answer. Um, but in principle, if you have the density of the planet, you can get the mass of the planet, and then you can figure out what the value of the freefall acceleration is near the planet's surface, and from that you can figure out the value of g. Now, more recently, and, and using actually some satellites, uh, NASA was able to measure the value of g. Basically, they place a couple of satellites, um, I think in orbit somewhere, and the satellites are able to measure what the force of attraction between one, uh, between itself and the other satellite, basically by measuring how much it accelerates towards the other satellite. And so they have two satellites, they know how far apart they are, they know what the acceleration towards each other are, and they also, of course, know what the mass is to pretty good detail. And so from that, you're able to get a value for G. And all of those values of g end up coming pretty close to that 6.67 times 10 to the minus 11 value. Okay, the next thing that I wanted to hit on um, when talking about universal gravitation is tides. Um, basically, the, the tides on the Earth and elsewhere are due to what might be called tidal forces. Um, go figure. Well... The, the tidal force basically is due to the fact that if you have, let's say, the moon and the earth, the moon will exert a different amount of force of gravity on the earth's surface at this point than it will at this point. And the reason being that this point is closer to the moon than this point is. This one is sort of intermediate between the moon. Now, the actual um, tides, you can see in this diagram, there's high tides, there's low tides, and where are they? Well, the high tides are the side that is nearest to the moon, but also the one that is farthest from the moon. And the low tide then are sort of at the poles um, at this particular point, or um, sort of on the sides of the earth that are facing not really towards, but not really away from the moon. Um, so this right here, actually, the, the pole is pointing up uh, out of the page at us. So basically, the low tides are um, sort of near, say, Mexico or Panama or whatever, and near South Asia. And at the same time, high tide is somewhere in the middle of the Pacific Ocean and maybe somewhere in Europe. Uh, in any case, the reason for these tides is that the uh, there's a sort of a net difference in force between uh, how much the uh, moon pulls on, say, the surface of the water versus the surface of the earth under the water, here and here, and so on. So on this side right here, the water is closest to the moon, gets the most force on it, the land that's sitting on the water has a little less force on it, so it looks like a swelling effect out here. The water has less force than the land, so again, it ends up looking like a swelling effect because 
the land is sort of being pulled this way, whereas the water is being pulled more weakly this way. By the way, what this diagram is basically showing you is basically the difference in force uh, for two locations uh, for this extended object, namely the Earth, between what the the uh, moon is pulling on at this location versus, say, the center of the Earth. So you can see there's a lot more pull here. There's a lot less pull uh, here. And so perpendicular to the axis along which the center of the Earth and the, the moon lies is where you'll find the high tide. Uh, uh, excuse me, along this axis is where you find the high tide. Perpendicular to this axis is where you end up finding a low tide. Now you may be wondering why is it that the uh, moon is the one that has such an effect on the Earth's tides. Uh, after all, the sun actually applies about 170 times more gravitational force on the Earth than the moon does. Um, so in other words, the force on the Earth from the sun is in fact greater than the force on the Earth from the moon. And uh, the thing is, though, that the sun is also quite a bit farther away on average from the Earth than the moon is. And the end result of this is that the difference in force for the Earth's surface, um, near surface versus, say, far surface from the sun, is much less for the sun than the difference for the near for surface and far surface for the moon. And this is basically because the gradient of the force is so low um, for the gravitational force from the sun on the earth as compared to the gradient from the moon on the earth. And so basically the difference in sun's gravitation ends up being about 3% of the difference for the moon's gravitation. So therefore the moon will have the, the greater effect on the tides. For what it's worth, the sun does still play some effect on the tides. Um, it turns out that when you have the sun and the moon aligned with each other, either uh, sun, moon, earth, or sun, earth, moon, then what you have is called a spring tide. And then when you're at a right angle like this, you get what's called a nape tide or a nape tide. Um, so there is some effect. It just turns out that it's a much lesser effect than just the, the effect from the moon's orbit. Okay, so there are some other interesting tidal effects, one of which was sort of alluded to at the beginning of this uh, lecture set. Uh, they show up, obviously, in astrophysics um, quite a bit. One is actually kind of a geophysics, if you will, uh, which is that there's volcanic activity uh, on the moon Io, which is a moon orbiting Jupiter, and it's thought to be driven actually by the tidal forces from Jupiter. Now, Io is relatively close to Jupiter, um, Jupiter obviously being quite a bit larger than, say, the Earth, so the force from uh, Jupiter to Io is quite a bit larger than the force from the Earth to the Moon. Um, another interesting effect is what's been named spaghettiification. And this is a process by which you get an object that's stretched along one particular dimension and similarly compressed along another dimension thanks to very extreme tidal forces. Usually you find this near um, like a neutron star surface or even more so near the surface, uh, near, the, near maybe the, um, the event horizon of a black hole. So this image right here shows a star which is orbiting a black hole. The black hole um, in this visualization is just treated like literally a black spot in space. Um, and Basically, the star is being literally ripped apart by the extreme gravity force from this black hole. And you can see that this ripping apart 
the star kind of has this matter that turns into what looks like a very long and ultimately pretty thin strand, like spaghetti, actually. And um, another interesting effect from tidal forces is what's called um, basically tidal locking. What happens is that you get a tidal force from the moon, and that tidal force from the moon on the earth basically uh, converts from what's called mechanical energy of the earth's oceans into heat and it, it also uh, converts the rotational energy of the earth itself into heat and we'll learn about energy conservation in a future lecture set but the end result of this is basically that as time passes the rotation of the Earth is actually slowing down somewhat, thanks to the Moon, also thanks for that matter to the Sun. And in fact, this process has already occurred for the Moon. The Moon, even though it doesn't have any oceans, does have or did used to have rotational energy as it spun about its axis. And the tidal effects from the Earth on the Moon have caused the moon's rotation to slow to the point where the moon doesn't actually rotate on its axis anymore. It doesn't perceptibly, or perceptibly rotate anymore. And so basically the same face of the moon is always pointing towards the earth as it goes around its orbit. And the same thing has actually happened uh, for some of the other moons in the solar system, obviously Jupiter's moons are all tidally locked to Jupiter. And in fact, uh, talking to an astronomer at some point who specialized in uh, basically planetary and specifically exoplanetary astronomy, he mentioned that at some point in the past, the Earth actually had a, um, you know, like maybe around the time of the dinosaurs even, the Earth actually had a rotational period of um, several hours. Uh, now, of course, the rotational period is 24 hours, and hence that's what is a full day. So once upon a time, it might have been as short as, say, six hours. I wanted to close out today's lecture with another example. And this one will be um, sort of an example of tidal locking, although it's really more an example of apparent weight. Um, but just for fun, what is the difference in apparent weight between the Earth as it is uh, right now, spinning with its, um, with its angular speed of 7.27 times 10 to the negative 5 radians per second, and what it will be at some distant time in the future, uh, again, assuming all else is equal, but assuming that the Earth has become tidally locked and no longer spins about its axis. So let's see how we do that. With the Earth's rotation, you have to account for um, the basically centripetal acceleration. So basically, if you take all the forces that act upon an object, um, that should be, for example, maybe the force of a scale uh, minus the, or plus the force of gravity, excuse me, um, for an object. And that actually has to be the mass of the object times the centripetal acceleration. And again, the centripetal acceleration is going to be given by negative v squared over r, or if you'd prefer, that is negative of, um, and this again is, kind of uh, keeping track of the direction, is going to be negative of omega times r quantity squared over r r hat. And so if you just want the centripetal acceleration magnitude, this looks like omega squared r for what that's worth. Now, um, if we're considering the Earth itself, you're standing somewhere on the surface of the Earth, this right here represents the force of a scale. Um, so this is force read by scale. 
and so that is a parent weight. So this right here is the thing that we're interested in. Now, um, the force of gravity near the Earth's surface, Fg, would look like m times g. Um, so we can combine these things by noting now that we have the condition that the scale reading or the apparent weight and the uh, gravitational force are basically in more or less opposite directions. Um, and again, there is maybe some small component for the scale, um, which is lends itself to a centripetal acceleration. But if we consider these things to be at the Earth's equator, then these are in exactly opposite directions. And so the, the scale reading by the force minus the weight should be our um, centripetal acceleration. So this gives us m times, uh, we could say, omega squared times r. Uh, where r is in fact the radius of the earth. And so basically what this is telling us is that the scale reading or the apparent weight should be the mass um, of the thing being weighed times the free fall acceleration g that's 9.8 meters per second squared or 9.8 newtons per kilogram minus the the um, angular speed times the radius of the earth. Okay, so this is now true whether the earth is spinning as we have today at 7.72 .72 times 10 to the minus five radians per second, but it's also true when the earth stops spinning. Uh, in that case, omega is equal to zero. So if we wanna find the change in the apparent weight, delta F, this is basically force of scale for spinning. Um, I'm actually going to put a little r for rotating minus the force on the scale when it has stopped. Um, so stopped would be maybe tidally locked. So I'm going to use a t for that. You can see why I'm having to pick strange letters. Otherwise, I end up with just S's. Okay, so delta F then becomes mg, and when it is uh, rotating, that's g minus omega squared times r earth, and then that is going to be minus m times g minus zero because it has stopped spinning, so omega is now zero. And so you can see that the mg's are going to end up canceling, and basically the the dis the uh, difference in apparent weight is just going to be uh, negative omega squared times r earth. So what is omega squared times r earth going to give us? Well, um, this means that we have negative of um, so the omega was basically given by 7.27 times 10 to the negative 5 radians per second. So we're squaring that. And then the radius of the earth, again, you might want to look it up in the back of one of the OpenStax textbooks uh, from the astronomical data. Since in the last example I did university th physics, I'll do college physics textbook in this example. So for, for college physics, you go to useful information, which is appendix C, and then specifically you want solar system data, so table C3. And if you want the radius of the Earth, here it is, 6.376 times 10 to the 6. So if you plug all this into your calculator, you end up getting a difference of negative 3.3 um, 699, so basically 3.37 times 10 uh, to the minus 2. 
and the the units by the way for this um, this right here is basically difference in force per unit mass for what it's worth um, because I don't have a value of the mass of your object so if we wanted to actually get the force you'd have to have a massive object but um, your difference in force per unit mass ends up being this many meters per second squared so you could compare this to the original uh, value of the force per unit mass which is 9.8 meters per second squared and what you find is that this is about three uh, excuse me about 0.3 poor about 0.34 percent of the value of G so it's not a very large effect at all all right so that is it for today's lecture um, I seem to be um, maybe a couple minutes over the my self-imposed time limit but not too bad um, so thank you for watching and uh, Got to give a couple seconds to show off all the sources that I pulled from just to give them credit. Um, so hope you found this helpful and thanks for watching.